Hello, my name is Megan Beats, and I'm joined in the studio today by Jason Ross of The Basement Team, who has just produced a new pedagogical web page on Johannes Kepler's new astronomy. So Jason, um, first of all, I guess I'll just ask you to tell us what's on the page, and then also why. Why Kepler? Why would a political action committee be featuring a pedagogical web page on Kepler? Well, I'd say there's a, a few reasons on it. Um, there are regards to the asteroids that we're, we're, we're confronting right now, and then some more general concepts about sense perception and about economics. So this is, a, this is actually only a partial new web page on Kepler. It only goes through the beginning of his book, The Astronomia Nova. And it's a follow-up on a project that got started six, seven years ago where Mr. LaRouche, as part of a plan to create an economics education program, insisted that we develop a program for going through the inside path of science. So you can sort of look back at, at what breakthroughs have been made in science and try to figure out, well, you know, what kind of thinking took place, et cetera. But if you don't really get inside what the discovery was and figure out what did Kepler do, you don't really know how science is made. And if you're going to be a, a real competent economist, you've got to know how do breakthroughs get made because that's what makes human economy possible. That's what makes us different from the animals. So since Kepler is the first modern scientist and the new astronomy is his first really major work, um, it made sense to, to develop a, a plan to go through it. So what's currently on the site is unfortunately only the beginning of his book so far. But it's where he goes through why the systems, why the approaches of other astronomers could never work. So people before him, like Ptolemy, like uh, people have probably heard of him. He says that the Earth is the center of everything. Copernicus, who put the sun almost in the middle, and his boss, Tycho Brahe. These three astronomers had three different systems. But Kepler showed that they were all mathematically equivalent. So you might say that that means there is no truth in astronomy, that it's all just whatever way you want to do the calculations to find out if you figured where a planet would be in the sky. But Kepler said, no, forget it. There's some actual reason of why they move. Why do they do what they do and not do something else? And that physical aspect of astronomy, that's part of your hypothesis. That was a first. This is the beginning of saying that astronomy is not just observing things and matching the observations, but of knowing a physical cause, of knowing why. It was the first astrophysics. Okay, so that gets me to my second question, which is that Mr. LaRouche has been putting a lot, a lot of emphasis in the recent period on the problem in society being that people believe in appearances. They believe that you know things, you know why things are happening because of what they see and what they touch and what they're told in the news, sense perception. So. And the, the, the corollary of that is that they don't know how the human mind works. So you've touched on it, but I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how, why Kepler, how does Kepler help us actually confront that problem and know what real thinking is? Well, one of the things I'm happiest about with this new website is that it's, compared to the earlier edition, it's got a much more expanded uh, description or work through about how observations take place. Because most people, I mean, we don't really do observations that much. Astro oh, the astronomy. Sky. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nighttime astronomy is not really a, you know, a popular pastime anymore. It's also much harder than it used to be. If you live in a city, you can't see anything anyway. It doesn't matter if you want to look at the stars. You can't, you're not going to be able to pick out planets very easily. Right. The, the sky is too light. So it's really helpful to actually, and the site does it, go through what do you actually see. And you realize how very difficult it is out of this whole sea of stars, there's only a few of them that move unusually, the, the planets, and that from those just dots changing their positions to be able to develop a whole physical theory about how the sun is the cause of the motions, Kepler begins developing his theory of gravitation, and to think that it all comes from, you know, a few spots that change their position compared to the other stars in the sky is pretty phenomenal. I think that uh, what we're going to get to at the site is the vicarious hypothesis. So this is where Kepler takes the approach of his predecessors. He says, look, uh, let me follow your method. Let me use mathematics. I'll take some observations, and I'll use mathematics to make the best model that matches the observations. And he does it, and it works very well. 
but he knows that it includes a, a distance between the sun and Mars is the center of Mars's orbit. It includes a distance that he knows isn't right. So he can either have a model that works that he knows is physically wrong, or if he adjusts that physical parameter so it's right, then it doesn't tell you where Mars is going to be. So he really explicitly shows you the limits of trying to use mathematics to understand reality. And it's, it's, it was very important for him to do it for the people he was talking to, the other astronomers of his day, to make the case that, hey, it's impossible to take this approach. Otherwise, people might look at his theory as just one more theory. There's Kepler. He thinks that the planets move around the sun because the sun's actually causing that. Well, that's his theory. I've got mine. There's 20 spheres that are moving, you know, guided by intelligences out in the heavens, and that's what makes the planets move. He's got his, his theory. I've got mine. He showed that no, that their approach can't work. So really is a question of how do you know that something is true? Mm -hmm. Rather than interpreting the facts or having some kind of spin on something, how do you actually, how can you actually feel or know truth? Yeah, because Kepler says you could have two theories. You could have two different hypotheses that both make the same results, that give you the same you know, calculations. So you'd use both theories, you'd say, where is Mars going to be? And it tells you it's next to you know, this, the same star. And you look, and they're both right. And he's just saying, well, no, no, because there's some reason that that happened. And if you don't include the reason for why things occur, then you don't have a real theory. And that was really a breakthrough. People did not think in those terms in his day. Well, I think you can also see, because lo you look at the outcome of after Kepler, you see what that unleashed in science, all of the progress that unleashed in science, and frankly also in music, leading into the discoveries of Bach. And I think you can also see the, the effect of somebody like Kepler versus the effect of all of his predecessors on the advancement of civilization. Mm -hmm. And that gets back to our problem today. Well, it does, and the, the, the asteroid problem, which you're maybe more familiar with. But, you know, in, in his later work, when Kepler looked at the harmonics of the solar system as a whole, that was an approach where it was, it was really clearly about why were the planets the way they were instead of a different way? Why did the orbits have the characteristics that they did? There's a lot of ways you could put together a solar system, but you know, there's only one way that it actually is. Why that way? And that's something where you're getting at an idea of cause that's not about moment to moment, that, that can't be reduced to a moment to moment force type effect the way, the way uh, things are presented today. And it's, it gives us an insight into a method for us to approach now for the asteroids, where we've got you know, millions of asteroids. We've got you know, uh, a similar number of ones even that are very near the Earth. And if we only understand them as individual rocks floating out there, we, it unnecessarily limits us. You know, so if we're going to try and make hypotheses about how they operate as a system, it makes sense to go back to what Kepler did with looking at the planets as a system. And that, he doesn't get at that in the new astronomy, but this, does, this work lays the groundwork for then what he does in the, the harmonies of the world. So they go together. Okay, and then uh, one last question, which I think gets to something you brought up briefly already, which is the upcoming part two, where you feature uh, Kepler's vicarious hypothesis. So I was just wondering if you could say something about that, but particularly with, in respect to what Mr. LaRouche has been saying, that Kepler's vicarious hypothesis and classical metaphor have a relationship and that that's actually how you come to, to know something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, metaphor is a very misunderstood term. You know, it, it, we get it in English class and it means various things about right. literature, maybe, you know. Maybe you think of the work Animal Farm, where you know the pigs aren't really pigs; they represent <laughs> something else. And maybe that's an allegory, not a metaphor. But the, the real the real power of metaphor is not saying something using an unusual way of describing it, where you could have said it in another way. That is, you know, with a riddle, you figure out an unusual way of describing something. The thing you're actually talking about is something usually very simple, and then people get it, and then they get the riddle, and they say, ah, this is the thing that you were talking about, and you described it in a funny way, and you tricked me, and now I figured it out, and that's, you know, maybe that's a fun thing to do. The real power of metaphor is when you're talking about something that you couldn't have said in another way. When you're deriving a new concept that doesn't currently exist in your language culture within the, the realm of possible thoughts that you have, and the way you drive someone to make that discovery was by presenting them with a very specific sort of paradox. 
So you show them an impossibility in their thinking, a very specific one, and then that forces them to make the same discovery that you've made in developing a new concept. And that's really, I mean, Kepler's approach in part two is just amazingly, it's the same approach that Plato's Socrates takes, where he doesn't tell somebody that they're wrong directly usually. He shows them how they disagree with themselves by showing them how different thoughts that they have put together don't mesh. They create a paradox. And then that means that the person he's talking to has to come up with a new idea. Kepler does the same thing. He takes the approaches of his, of his predecessors, he puts them together, and he shows them that they disagree with themselves, that their own model gives, con their own approach gives contradictory results. And that forces them to then say, okay, you know what? This approach doesn't work. I'm open. What, what's, what's the new idea here? What's the new idea? And then Kepler's physical cause of motion is something that has nothing to do with observations, angles, circles, points. It's not mathematical. It's physical. And a new physical idea, I mean, he's really, like, if you think about how he's just really, like, sort of walking off a cliff of, of what was known and accepted at that time to do something totally new, it's pretty amazing how brave he was to venture off and to say there's a physical cause of the motions. It has something to do with how close they are to the sun. And really just from that idea and some ideas about magnets, he sort of put everything together and really figured it out, figured out the paths of the planets. And he's good enough to you know, write a book that goes through like a good drama or like a Socratic dialogue why what he did was necessary. And so people can have access to that. And I think this is crucial, and it's what you opened with, is the, the question of human economics and what actually drives an economic system being the introduction of previously completely unknown principles. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what human culture is. That's what people do. We figure out new things. And if there are people in the past who have done a very good job of it, it makes sense to see what they did. <laughs> good. Okay, well, thanks very much, Jason. Um, so people can access the new web page at the site that you see at the bottom of the screen. And stay tuned to Liberge Pack TV.